I'm Ed Reimers at a place called Holy Lock in Scotland. One of our far-flung replenishment sites serving Polaris missile-carrying submarines around the world. The Polaris squadron has been operating out of Scotland since 1960. Here at Holy Lock aboard the Simon Lake, the commander of submarine squadron 14 is Commodore Benjamin F. Sherman, Jr. Uh, Commodore, could you tell us what is the mission of a Polaris submarine squadron? Our mission is to provide, on a continuing basis, ready FBM submarines to go out on Polaris deterrent patrols. We provide ready submarines to the unified commander, in this case, Sink Plant, to be available for whatever targeting he has assigned to these submarines. Let's presume that uh, rather than the beginning of a patrol, that you're coming to the end of one. Could you just tell us generally what your procedure is? Yes, sir. The procedure is uh, we will surface out in the op outer operating areas, proceed up the Clyde on the surface. Uh, we will be met off clock point uh, down the river here by a tug. Commodore Sherman will normally board at that point together with a number of his staff and tender personnel. I meet these submarines as they come in. We find out what their problems are. We're particularly interested in any peculiarities that might have happened on the patrol, what major material problems they have, so that we can get our forces in order and get geared up to, to make the repairs that are necessary. The tender is the Thomas Jefferson's home for a third of the year. Uh, she knows our problems. We have worked with her people. Uh, we're familiar with them. Uh, we may have problems when we leave on patrol that we leave with her uh, for solution when we get back. Simon Lake serves as a command ship for Commander Submarine Squadron 14, and we're responsible for the repair and supply of a squadron of nine Polaris submarines, ranging from the oldest, the USS George Washington, to some of the newer classes. At this site, we have supported every class of missile and every class of Polaris submarine. In order to do this, I have a crew of approximately 1,100 men. We have no way of anticipating the problems that a submarine will bring us. As a result, our workshops have to be prepared on short notice to accomplish a variety of tasks, which may range from the most complicated technical electronic repair in support of the navigation and fire control systems of the submarine, through the demanding nuclear repair for its propulsion plant to some of the most basic skills known to man, such as foundry and heavy metal working. This activity, the maintenance and resupplying of Polaris submarines, is duplicated at other forward area replenishment sites. Rota, Spain, for Polaris Mediterranean operations, and Guam, serving Polaris in the Pacific. Sharing responsibilities with Holy Lock for Atlantic operations is the stateside Polaris replenishment site at Charleston, South Carolina. It is at these places that Polaris makes known its presence in a visible way, interfacing with the local cultures and societies. Even in fact, I even taught your own people on the Proteus in these days, not the Simon Lake, how to sail. You were teaching our sailors to be sailors. That's really funny, it is. But of course, being a supply ship, you know, we don't expect sailors and supply ships. Sailors are different altogether. There's always something going on in Scotland that you could consider special, from the sheepdog trials in the spring through the Cowell Games and the Edinburgh Festival. There's always some sort of activity going on. Polaris submarines have two crews, called the Blue and the Gold. The men of the Gold crew are now free to return to their families stateside, or as many a Polaris seaman before has done, free to take advantage of 30 days leave and partake of a potpourri of fascinating sights and sounds and people and tradition so close at hand in this part of the world. Here in Danoon, 
the Polaris sailor gets his first glimpse of Scottish life. And on this day, the traditional Highland Games are in full swing. The colorful excitement of the games and the skirling of the pipes offer a spirited contrast to the otherwise quiet beauty of the surrounding Scottish countryside. Any visit to Scotland to be complete should include its capital city, Edinburgh. The borough on the hill with its famous floral clock Princess Street, its monuments and memorials, its famous castles, and a thousand years of history. Here, near the end of summer, the city's number one attraction is the world-renowned Edinburgh International Festival. On famed Princess Street, streams of cars and buses and crowds of visitors proclaim that the gala event is really underway. Firmly established as the finest event of its kind, the festival presents in all areas of art the very finest and attracts to Edinburgh some of the greatest artists in the world. Without a doubt, the single most popular event in the entire festival program is the exciting military tattoo presented each evening during the festival at historic Edinburgh Castle. The setting is ideal, with the castle's esplanade forming the arena and the floodlit ramparts providing a spectacularly effective background.
For the Polaris sailor, these are all wondrous scenes to behold and appreciate. So it is fitting that from here, our attention is directed halfway around the globe to an exotic portion of a new world. By comparison, everything in this corner of the world is in direct contrast to the places we've been. This is the land where both a greeting and farewell share but a single word. Aloha, and welcome to Hawaii and the beach at Waikiki. In these surroundings, the Polaris sailor in the Pacific rejoins his family for a well-deserved rest. hundred years, the islands of Hawaii have conjured up dreams of romance and beauty. For everyone, a real honest-to-goodness paradise right here on Earth. Like all lands, the islands are rich in their legend, in their traditions, and in their culture. Native Hawaiian daughter, Victoria Kekua Okalani, tells us about the Polynesian Cultural Center located here on Oahu. Victoria, what is the Polynesian Cultural Center and what does it do? The Polynesian Cultural Center is a gathering place of the various Polynesian cultures and it is portrayed in six different villages that we have here at the center. <laughs>
Wherever you go in these Hawaiian islands, you are literally standing on a volcano. Mauna Loa is the newest, and its eruptions, when they occur, are earth-shaking. This is Kilauea, the active little sister of Mauna Loa, where now resides the ancient legendary volcano goddess Pele. Her fiery tantrums, too numerous to count, have created hundreds of acres of blackened, bizarre landscape. But there are so many beautiful Hawaii's, Kauai and the Nepali coast, the birthplace of the goddess Pele. It has many deep blue-green pools surrounded by ginger, jungled valleys covered with flowers, smooth sand beaches and good waves. Everyone tries it. Kauai is really the garden island. She has bougainvillea, many waterfalls, pandanus trees, rainforests, and a huge mountain, Mount Waialeale, which is 5,000 feet high and has so much rain that it is called Kauai Amamo Kalani Pono, which means the fountainhead of many waters from on high and bubbling up from below. During the final days of the Polaris sailor's stay in his island home, the greatest part of his time will be spent at the FBM Weapon System Training School here at Pearl Harbor. The training facility is equipped with simulators which duplicate the systems aboard the submarine. While some specialized courses may be taken, the greatest emphasis is on team efficiency. Each crewman is carefully rehearsed in duties he will perform at sea for the efficiency of the system can be no greater than the proficiency of any one member of the crew. Then retrained and refreshed, the entire Polaris crew begins its 3,500 mile flight back to the Polaris replenishment site on Guam. There they will relieve the incoming crew and take over command and operation of the ship in preparation for its next patrol. Now, the glamour of the outside world is replaced by an urgency to conform to the stringent schedules needed to bring the submarine to the peak of efficiency. So necessary in that long patrol, somewhere in a secret. <laughs> to this outpost in the far Pacific come supply ships, bringing tons of military and non-military supplies to this tender which will in turn supply the fleet of Polaris submarines going out on patrol from here, Apra Harbor, Guam. The Polaris submarine on patrol is alive 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for at least two months. Supplies for over 100 men and their ship must be available. The squadron commander of Polaris submarines in the Pacific is Commodore Pat Hannafin. Commodore, I know that the Brody is here is more than just a huge steel supply store for Polaris submarines, but I wonder if you could tell us, sir, just what are its primary missions and functions? Well, Ed, that's true. Proteus is more than just a supply ship. She is the focal point in the Pacific for all of our Polaris operations. I have my headquarters here. She's charged to repair and provision each one of these ships as they come in off patrol. She can do almost anything that's required to get these ships ready to go back to sea. For example, she can 
repair any piece of equipment on the ship, from the complex weapon systems to the navigation, communications, electronics, and all of the engineering aspects of each one of these submarines. Any job that needs to be accomplished on the ship can be either repaired aboard the submarine or taken up to the shops. One of the advantages of the warm weather and the good climate is that we can take one of the ships across the way over here into the dry dock, take it clear out of the water, do work on the hull, do a paint job that's good and will hold up. In addition to changing the propellers, doing any kind of underwater sea valve work that needs to be accomplished. For the men who are stationed here and perform the vital tasks needed to keep Polaris on station, Guam is home. And even here on one of our country's furthermost bastions of defense, where the mission at hand is all important, there are recreational diversions to be found. Guam offers an abundance of beautiful palm-lined beaches, and a variety of aquatic activities can be enjoyed in the warm tropical waters that surround the entire island. Mostly underwater photography around the reefs, spear fishing. Chief Wiesenberg does quite a bit of shelling and uh, exploring sunken ships, planes. What ships and planes, Chief? Uh, we've got three sunken ships in the outer harbor, the Nakamaru, Cormoran, and Isomaru. What kind of fish do you find out here, uh, Mel? Oh, just, uh, just about all, all of your tropical fish. Some very beautiful fish, some uh, very poisonous fish, too. Turkey fish, stone fish. The poison cones, calories, murex, just about all the uh, known shells in the world are found out here in Guam. As we know, modern history has been harsh to Guam. And unfortunately, much of the evidence of its ancient history and peoples has been lost forever. Its early history is now shrouded in the mists of island folklore and legend. But some evidence does remain of the early Chamorros, as it does of the over 200 years of early Spanish rule. Yumatak village. Here it is said Magellan landed, near the middle of the 16th century. 20th century Agana, Guam's capital, crossroads of the Pacific's expanding, thriving commerce. But finally, at this outpost, located in a far corner of the free world, the time has arrived when the operation that is being and will be repeated around the globe, Holylock, Rota, Charleston, and Guam, is once again set in motion. Fully provisioned, fully armed, and with a fresh crew, this Polaris submarine moves away from its last contact with land and proceeds to its patrol area somewhere beneath the broad Pacific Ocean. Fire the ship. Fire the ship, aye, sir. Open the forward group vents. Open the forward group vents, aye. Forward group open. Very well. Open the after group vents. Open the after group, aye. Five degree down bubble. After group open. Very well. All vents open. Very well. You have speed control, make your depth five, eight feet. Its passage will be duly noted on operational charts in the Pentagon and Washington, D.C. But one other highly interested observer will note this sailing, lending added emphasis to its importance. Stand by for a round of bearing. All hit two thirds. Mark the point. Bearing. Mark. Is this a scheduled deployment or merely a sea trial? By the time these observers know for sure, this Polaris submarine will be on station, hidden in the depths. Its mere presence contributing to that framework of defense within which free men around the world may continue to enjoy their own individual ways of life.